afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. The National Endowment for the Arts is the largest grant maker to arts organizations in the country. By its charter, the NEA chairperson shall ensure that artistic excellence and artistic merit are the criteria by which applications are judged. Since its creation in 1965, the NEA has been a lightning rod for controversy and political debate. Its assessments of what is art and what is worthy of funding have been hotly debated and often politicized. And at various times, there have been, there's been controversy over efforts to reduce or eliminate funding to the NEA itself. The country's current economic crisis and budget cutting pressures have not made life any easier for the NEA, nor has political climate made its decisions any less controversial. Today's speaker, Rocco Landisman, chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, does not shrink from controversy or criticism, and he is not one to mince words in his zealous fight to make sure that the arts have a place at the table of national priorities. He has termed governmental support to the arts, quote, pitiful, unquote. And he has called himself a hawk on the need for greater spending and investing in the arts, while at the same time he has questioned sacred cows within the arts community itself. An energetic spokesman for the cause, Mr. Landisman has carried out a national tour he calls Art Works to highlight the arts' crucial role in the nation's culture. He has decried the lack of arts education in the schools and the reflexive cutting of arts programs from school budgets. Mr. Landisman preaches that the arts are key to not only the spirit, but the economic development of communities, and that the arts and artists are, quote, placemakers, unquote, that make a community special. Certainly Cleveland, and many of you here today, stand as a compelling testimonial to the wisdom of his view. Mr. Landisman was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, he pursued his undergraduate education at Colby College and the University of Wisconsin and earned a doctorate in dramatic literature at the Yale School of Drama. In 1977, he left his professorship at Yale to start a private investment fund, which he ran until his appointment as president of a company that owns and operates five Broadway theaters. Mr. Landisman produced numerous Tony Award-winning Broadway shows and Hopefully not as living proof that life imitates art, he produced the producers. <laughs> Mr. Landisman has been active on numerous leading arts-related boards, and he has vigorously engaged the ongoing debate about arts policy across the country, and he's been widely published on arts issues. Mr. Landisman's greatest passions are theater. He has owned theaters. Baseball, he has owned minor league teams. Horse racing, he has owned racehorses and country music. He owns all of Roger Miller's LPs. <laughs> As he has said at the National Endowment for the Arts, quote, we are here to ensure the survival of the most creative and most dynamic. So he could not have come to a better place than Cleveland. And as one leader in the arts world said of him, quote, Rocco speaks his mind, he does not defer his opinions. So he could not have come to a better place than the City Club of Cleveland. Please welcome Rocco Landisman. Thanks so much, Hugh, for such a warm and, and fulsome introduction. And thanks to the City Club for having me here at what I have understood as a forum with a tremendous amount of of tradition and importance throughout, throughout the years. I'm thrilled to finally be in Cleveland today. We've been talking with Dina Epstein and the, and the Gunn Foundation for over a year now, hearing how Cleveland is the textbook for creative placemaking in this country. And today I'm literally uh, crisscrossing the city to see what is happening for myself. From the Gordon Square Arts District to Playhouse Square, uh, to Collinwood, and of course, the University Circle. Cleveland is using the arts to literally shape its social, physical, and economic character, which is exactly the definition of creative placemaking at the NEA. I just spent a couple of hours with, uh, with Art Falco, which was an amazing tour of his, uh, his, his operation. 
And I can't think of a better showcase for what our theme has been at the NEA than, than Playhouse Square and that, uh, and that operation. Um, it, it's, uh, it's really very, very impressive. We, we talk about ourselves uh, wanting to be at the intersection of, of art and the, and the real world. And what better example uh, could, could there be about the relationship of, uh, of theater, the performing arts as in arts in general, and economic development and, and urban renewal? I think it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous thing to see and, and, uh, and a tremendous um, uh, testament to, to, to what, what, what happens here in Cleveland in terms of partnership, civic engagement, and, and, and support. And all across America, our communities are in sore need of being reshaped reinvigorated and revitalized. The old strategy for community development, the old strategies are not working, and it's time to try something new. I'm calling for our country to double down on the arts. Why? Two reasons. First, art and artists themselves exist in every community in this country. And secondly, art is, in this digital age, one of the very few things left that has to be consumed in person, in place, and in real time. Art is fundamentally place-based. Think about the typical artist bio, which begins, Jane Doe lives and works in such and such a place. We know that place informs the arts. It's like the French concept of terroir. The best wine reflects the unique geography, geology, and microclimate of the, air, of the area in which the grapes were grown. In the same way, the best art reflects its unique local influences. There's a wonderful organization called Worm Farm over in Sauk County, Wisconsin, that has coined the term culture shed to refer to, quote, a geographic region irrigated by streams of local talent and fed by deep pools of human and natural history, an area nourished by what is cultivated locally. I like that, and it's a vital concept um, for all of us who care about the future of the arts. At the beginning of this year, I participated in a convening at Arena Stage in DC, and I talked about what I fear is the homogenization of theater in this country. Why is it happening? Too many artistic directors in this country define success as a combination of three things attendance, or butts in the seats, as we producers like to call them, income, and national attention. The easiest way to achieve those three elements is for theaters to reorient themselves to look toward Broadway. If a theater is producing a show that has been on or is headed to Broadway, they can count on robust ticket sales, some sort of commercial subsidy for producing the show, and perhaps a review in the New York Times. But what is the result of defining success that way? Too many resident theaters across the country whose seasons are interchangeable. The plays that are locally uh, presented bear no re relationship to their locality. And yes, there are notable exceptions to this. Look right here at the Cleveland Playhouse. This year's season mixes Bertolt Brecht, August Wilson, and Sarah Rule with musicals and Shakespeare in its lab space. That is a venturesome season. And it is a season that was constructed in response to a specific set of audiences and artists. And I don't think there could be a better example than what we just saw this morning at the, uh, at the Cleveland Public Theater. Uh, Raymond Bobgan has an amazing operation there. And what was interesting about it, it struck me right away, that this is not a way station to some other place, to um, New York City or some uh, you know, commercial production somewhere. Uh, it really exists for its community there, for its, uh, for its actors, its artists. It's a destination uh, in itself, not um, uh, a place on the way uh, to, to, to somewhere else. And I think that's very important, particularly as you're dealing with, with subsidies, a protected environment uh, with which to do your work. I wish I could transplant uh, what is happening in Gordon Square all around the country, because not only are they engaging their own artists and their own uh, artistic ethos, uh, but they are transforming a neighborhood, a community. And, and that kind of model is what we want to highlight and showcase and bring all across the country to every community that we can. At the NEA, we want to encourage this, so we were calling for two things to happen simultaneously. We need artists to invest in the places where they live, 
We see that in Gordon Square. And we need those places to invest in their artists. Can this happen? Absolutely. It's happening in Gordon Square. It's happening in Playhouse Square. It's happening all across Cleveland. But can it happen nationally and in every place? Well, I think it can. In fact, the Knight Foundation re recently released Gallup's Soul of the Community poll, which reports on the factors that create a sense of attachment between people and place. Gallup looked at 26 Knight communities, including Akron, Ohio, where Knight has an ongoing investment, and reported on their top findings. What were the top three that people cited as making them love a place? Not jobs, not the economy, not schools. Of course, all three are important factors in choosing a place to live. All are very important anyway. But they are not what makes someone love to live in a place. The three drivers of attachment, the three things that make someone love their community, are social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. In other words, the arts. And besides a sense of attachment, if we turn to the work of researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, we find some other key things that come along with a robust arts community. Mark Stern and his colleagues have done longitudinal research on Philadelphia and Baltimore and discovered that the arts bring with them three primary benefits to communities. One, the arts are a force for social cohesion and civic engagement. In communities with a strong cultural presence, people are much more likely to engage in civic activities beyond the arts. They're much more likely to vote. They're much more likely to join other organizations. Community participation increases measurably, and the result is more stable neighborhoods. Two, the arts make a major difference in child welfare. Income groups with high cultural participation were more than twice as likely to have low truancy and juvenile delinquency rates. And three, art is a poverty fighter. Artists form clusters. Cultural institutions spring up near them. People gravitate there. Businesses follow people. Businesses hire, and a vigorous local economy is born. Just look at Gordon Square or the Creative Workforce Fellows. This is some pretty powerful stuff. Art creates community attachment. It increases civic engagement and child welfare. And it fights poverty while driving local economies. Wow. Why isn't everyone just wildly investing in the arts? I think some of the problem comes from the arts community ourselves. The arts community, in many ways rightly so, consider ourselves to be extremely special to be different and apart from the rest of society. There's a very positive aspect to this. At Columbia University, Joan Jeffrey did a study of aging visual artists and discovered that artist is a master identity that transcends race, gender, class, and age. As a result, aging artists have larger social networks with far more intergenerational contacts. Artists affiliate with other artists. They recognize themselves in one another and want to be connected. As they find each other, they build communities, neighborhoods, organizations, and businesses. In many ways, New York's Soho neighborhood is the kind of ur example of this. Uh, and it's a great and powerful redevelopment story. But it is one that is colored by gentrification. Why? Because the flip side of artists feeling special and apart is that they often do not see themselves as having anything in common with the other citizens who live in a city or town. Take the issue of artist housing. Many artists talk about artist live workspace as a right that comes with the specialness of the artist. But I don't need to build housing for Stephen Sondheim or Tony Kushner, thank you. Both are pretty special, but I believe that we need to build housing, artist housing, because artists are often, uh, are, are often a low income sector of the workforce and receive a majority of their income as independent contractors. Quote, they're often poor people. They need subsidized housing alongside other low-income, temporary, and self-employed workers. But we do not affiliate with, uh, with other low-income citizens because we too often see ourselves as separate and apart. As one colleague put it, artists are like, yeah, I may be poor, but I'm not poor like you. <laughs> but that, that is not happening here. The creative community in Cleveland embodies the notion of artist citizen. I've been seeing this all day long, and I think I'm going to continue to this afternoon, which is exactly the impulse that led me to begin, to begin changing how we talk about investing in the arts. 
Too often, we talk about what the arts need. We need more money, always, and certainly. Uh, we need larger audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, we should take credit for what the artists are steadily contributing to society, what we do for people, for communities of every size, and even for the American economy. To put it another way, we will make more progress we will marshal more resources for the arts if we stop asking what you can do for the arts and instead ask what the arts do for you. Historically, unemployment in this country was solved by having people move to where jobs were. People always would move to a, a town where there, were more, where there was more job availability. Today, that's not an option. People are stuck in their homes. They're underwater in their mortgages. They can't move. Instead, we need a strategy that will allow citizens to prosper in place a strategy that involves a net increase in new activity. And that net increase can only come from two things, increased consumption and innovation. The arts provide both. There's a constant flow of new performances, new exhibitions, new works of art for Americans to consume and enjoy. And the arts drive creativity and innovation. The arts are key to building strong, vibrant, and sustainable communities. And if we underscore that message, if we shift the conversation to what the arts bring to the table, I believe that we will also have a stronger, more vibrant, and sustainable arts community as well. At the NEA, there are two things we can do if we want to make a difference. The first is to provide direct funding, um, and we're doing that through an NEA funding program called Our Town. The second is to be a catalyst and spark a national movement which I believe we are doing through a national initiative that was just announced last week called Art Place. Let me talk a little about both of them, and let's start with Our Town. It's called Our Town, frankly, because that's the name of a play, and I'm a theatrical producer, and it turns out one of the few prerogatives of an NEA chairman is he gets to name things. <laughs> uh, but it's also called Our Town uh, to highlight the place-based aspect of the arts about which I keep talking. Let me walk you through two examples of the projects we are funding through our town that showcases this notion of creative placemaking. In fact, let's take the two projects that were funded in Ohio, both of which I've had a chance to see over the past few days during my visit. The first is in Hamilton, Ohio, about four and a half hours south of here. Artspace Projects is a national organization that builds affordable live workspace for artists, and in doing so, also creates arts districts at the center of communities. In Hamilton, art space is converting two vacant four-story historic buildings into 36 units of affordable live-work facility for artists and their families. The art space Hamilton Lofts will also provide 3,000 square feet uh, of storefront retail space and create a new exterior walkway and pedestrian plaza that will revitalize the downtown and, be creating, and, and begin creating new foot traffic for what has become an empty and neglected neighborhood. I mean, you could see this start to happen really in front of your eyes as you, as you tour the space. You can envision what it's, what it's going to be. And Hamilton is a place uh, with, with, with an arts history. They, they call themselves the, the city of, of, of sculpture. Importantly, this is not a transformation that is taking place in isolation. The hub of activity complements Hamilton's Vision 2020 plan for its downtown which is aimed at the cultural and economic revitalization of its central business district. During my time in Hamilton, I met with the mayor, city managers, city council members, a state representative, artists, and students, all of whom were deeply committed to both the city and its arts community. The arts were not an add-on or an extra. They were the core activity, one that both contributes to Hamilton's future and one that enjoys robust civic support. That is also the situation I found in Columbus yesterday, and Charlotte Kessler is here somewhere. Uh, we are investing in the Greater Columbus Arts Council for a public art program designed to reconnect the city with its waterfront and to engage the city with important issues. In conjunction with, uh, with, with Columbus's upcoming bicentennial celebration, public art will transform a seven block area surrounding the State House and Riverfront. Ohio State University is an important partner in this which is notable because the project does not take place physically on the university's campus. Instead, the arts have become a way for the university and the town to integrate. They actually have a tradition in this in Columbus. 
since the Wexner Center for the Arts is literally at the entrance to the campus. The public art will serve a practical purpose in helping people to rediscover the waterfront since historically Columbus has ignored its river, literally constructing a wall of buildings between the city and the water. That, that is what's happened. The public art will give people an excuse to explore the new river walkways that have been constructed. But the public art program is also taking on large civic issues and encouraging the citizens to engage. Public art will be integrated with Columbus's bus system. Other pieces will highlight the connection between what people throw, throw down storm drains and what appears in the river. And artists will work with the growing Ethiopian Eritre and Eritrean community in Columbus. And perhaps my favorite uh, proposition, artists will engage with the surface parking lots that are everywhere in downtown Columbus. Looking out of a window of the Arts Council offices uh, yesterday, we counted a dozen parking lots in that view. It was kind of amazing to see. Artists and architects will be commissioned to wrap and cover the kiosks in those parking lots uh, to transform what is at best utilitarian and more often just dreary into whimsical flights of fancy. This single project will literally change the look of downtown. Instead of celebrating parking, downtown Columbus will celebrate creativity. Again, in Columbus, this project has broad support from the mayor, city council, the university, and the philanthropic community. In total, we invested over $6.5 million in 51 communities across 34 states with the, with the Our Town program. Projects range from mapping cultural assets to planning arts districts. They include public art installations and public performances and festivals. Arts are bringing new foot traffic to abandoned neighborhoods and helping to integrate transportation hubs with pedestrian plazas. I'm very proud of each of these projects and I'm visiting as many of them as possible. In fact, just before I came to Ohio, uh, Ohio I was in Charleston, South Carolina to see the Our Town project there, which is transforming a neglected open space into an arts district around the Galliard Center. But NEA funding alone is not enough. There are more communities doing this work and we need to increase the resources for the arts. So let's get to that second role for the NEA, the catalytic role. As you know, I'm a recovering Broadway producer, and theater is by far the most collaborative of the art forms. I've always believed that. I found the same spirit of collaboration to be the hallmark of this administration when I arrived in Washington, DC. And I began having high-level conversations across many of the federal agencies and the private sector. Everyone I spoke with was interested in creating vibrant, sustainable communities, and all understood that we can only succeed, especially in this economy, if we get out of our silos and work together. Responding collectively and collaboratively to citizens' needs can bring real dynamic change. The intention was ambitious, but the plan was simple. Find ways that federal agencies, alongside the private sector, can use the arts as a fulcrum for revitalization. After two years of work, the result was announced this past Thursday. It was a very proud day for me. In an unprecedented public-private par partner collaboration, 11 of America's top foundations joined with the NEA and seven other federal agencies to establish Art Place, a nationwide initiative to drive revitalization in cities and towns with a new investment model that puts the arts at the center of economic development. The foundations, they're the top arts funders in this country, Bloomberg, Ford, Irvine, Knight, Kresge, McKnight, Mellon, Rasmussen, Robina, and Rockefeller put together $11.5 million to invest in 34 projects, each of which strategically integrates artists and arts organizations into key local efforts in transportation, housing, community development, job creation, and more. And beyond the direct funding that the foundations provide, seven federal agencies have joined with the NEA to take a look at those projects both to see how they align with, the, uh, with, with other federal investment and to showcase the projects as models for other communities. The federal agencies working with us are the Depar Departments of Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services, Agriculture, Education and Transportation, along with the leadership from the White House Office of Management and the Budget and the Domestic Policy Council. 
as you well know, some of those federal agencies have a lot more money than the NEA. And finally, Art Place will also be supported by a $12 million loan fund capitalized by six major financial, inst financial institutions, Bank of America, Chase, Citi, Deutsche Bank, MetLife, and Morgan Stanley. Just as we do at the NEA through the Our Town funding, Art Place neither treats the arts as an add-on nor expects developments to follow on its own from standalone investments in cultural projects. Instead, Art Place supports projects in which cultural groups operate in concert with other community partners, private and public. By leveraging the arts and culture with all the community's other existing assets, Art Place aims to help communities achieve vibrant growth while doing more with less. I believe that Art Place is in the process of reframing the discussion about investing in the arts, and if things proceed apace, I think we're on the brink of a true paradigm shift. One of Art Place's inaugural investments was in Cincinnati, Ohio. They invested in Artworks, an organization whose name I just love. Artworks partnered with a nonprofit in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and created Springboard Cincinnati, which provides artists with the entrepreneurial skills they need to be the small businesses that artists actually are. Springboard's inaugural class consisted of graphic designers, furniture fabricators, a restaurateur, jewelry artisans, a modern dance company, and others. Some were established, and others were still in their infancy. They were introduced to attorneys, accountants, real estate professionals, and other entrepreneurs who offered expertise and guidance. Yet again, the broader community came together around the arts, and the arts are helping to change Cincinnati for the better, in this case, transforming the Over the Rhine neighborhood from one of Cincinnati's worst neighborhoods to one of its most appealing. Overall, Art Place has invested in initiatives to revitalize neighborhoods, stimulate job growth and economic development, create new anchors for communities, increase the appeal of transit corridors, build brand for communities, address urban challenges, connect people and help them tell their stories, provide artist housing and workspace, and foster research and creative placemaking. I've seen a lot of that here in Cleveland today, which is why I want to underscore that concurrent with announcing the first round of grants, Art Place also announced the letter of inquiry, uh, 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 the process, letter of inquiry process for anyone interested in being part of the second round of funding. The application process is very straightforward, and all of the, all of the information is at artplaceamerica.org. Letters are due by middle of November. I don't think I could be any more forceful in, uh, than that in recommending an application. As I think you can tell, I'm really excited about the work we are doing, and I'm really excited to share it with you. I could easily go on for the rest of the day, but I'm equally excited to learn from you and to hear how art works here in Cleveland. So let me turn things back over to Hugh so we can get to my favorite portion of these events, the back and forth with you. Thanks so much. Hugh. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special forum featuring Rocco Landisman, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. We will return to our speaker in a minute for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate your questions now. Please remember to keep them brief. We remind you, members. It's questions, not speeches. Right. We remind you that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums, and we hope everyone listening will join the City Club. If you're not a member, please do join. Please visit our website to see a full schedule of our upcoming programs including tomorrow's forum with Eric Gordon, CEO of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. In 2012, the City Club of Cleveland will turn 100 years old. We're planning a number of great events and we'll be actively soliciting support through our campaign for a new century. Our celebration will begin on October 10th of this year with a national conference on free speech at the Allen Theater. 
please do come and join us on October 10th at the Allen Theater. For more information about our upcoming forums, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. And to learn more about the 100th anniversary events, visit the 100th anniversary tab of our website. If you wish to make reservation for upcoming programs or order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. Today is the Lucille and Robert Hayes Grease Annual Forum on Cultural Arts, made possible by a generous gift to the City Club Endowment by their children, Bob Grease and Ellen Grease Cole. Joining us at the head table today, are Bob Grease and his wife, Sally. Will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you very much. We're pleased to welcome guests at tables hosted by several cultural institutions. Please refer to the back of your program to see a full list of all of our table hosts. Thank you for joining us today. Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from all of you, including guests. Holding the microphones today, we have City Club Program Director Carrie Miller and Assistant Director for the 100th Anniversary, Betsy Wallace. First question, please. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I was wondering why, uh, what, what your thoughts on why, whether it be Christians objecting to a snippet of video or Jews kiboshing an exhibition of uh, drawings by Palestinian children in Oakland, why do you think it seems that religious zeal tends to be so successful in trumping freedom of speech in our social, political, and even our arts institutions' values? Boy, that's a, that's a deep question. That I, I think that's above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I think there's, there's certainly, uh, I mean, intolerance uh, is, is, a, is a fundamental issue. Um, you know, I like to think of the arts as a, as a, as a, as a, great, as a great bridge. Um, it's a way that people can, can work together and to understand um, other cultures. Um, it's interesting, I remember there was a, um, a, a meeting that I think Americans for the Arts had uh, in, in, in Sun Valley, and a um, retired general uh, was, was speaking, General um, Bivens. And he was saying that uh, traditionally, uh, as a nation, we've had to uh, prepare ourselves to, to defend, uh, defend ourselves against our most, most powerful enemy. And nowadays, we have to defend ourselves against our least powerful enemy. It's a completely different paradigm that exists in the world. And uh, against our least powerful enemies, the only real defense is culture and cultural exchange and, and, and understanding. And I think the arts play a huge role in that, and I hope are going to be much more a part of international diplomacy and part of our national profile going forward. Dr. Landisman, um, I am chair of the Department of Theater and Dance at Cleveland State University. Uh, cool. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the NEA. What I would like to talk or ask you about is, um, while you have wonderful support for our organizations across the country, I have colleagues like myself all around the country who, even though we have seen extreme growth in our departments, our funding has been cut drastically, especially in the last few years. What practical advice do you have for those of us who are training artists of the future uh, to convince our administrators or perhaps our state governments that the arts are a, a, a tangible and a real way of sustaining the community and a vibrant way of uh, adding to the local e economies. I think it's a battle that's fought in every community every, every day. I mean, one of the, uh, one of the things that we've done uh, at the NEA is to shift the discussion slightly to, to show how um, arts are not only valuable in, the, valuable in their own right, and of course they are, and the discussion has to always start there. You can't be apologetic for what the arts do on a human person-to-person -person level. But we've tried to make the case, uh, as I was, was talking about earlier, that the arts are an important part of the real world as we know it. They're a part of, um, of economic development. They're real jobs that they have a real role to play in, 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 um, in the larger society as we, as, as, as we know it, that, that arts jobs are real jobs, and um, that arts can be a, a tremendous catalyst for, uh, for economic activity, for social cohesion, for all those things 
uh, that I've that I've been, been talking about. I think uh, I think if I went to Congress or, or to the administration or to the private sector, and I said, um, you know, the um, City Opera is going to go out of business uh, in New York City um, in uh, six months if they don't get four million dollars. I think the response is going to be, well, that's a shame. We, we, we love the opera, but we have higher priorities on our plate right now than that. But if I make the case that the arts are a part of economic recovery and urban renewal and neighborhood revitalization, then I think it's a completely different narrative, and I think we have a completely different uh, hearing. And I think the relation to the community in which you are, um, your immediate community or the lar and the larger city, is more and more important, is, is the best way I would answer that. Dr. Lanson, thank you for joining us this side. By the way. Where are you? There you are, way down there. Okay. Hello, thank Hi. you. Cheryl Hoffman. Thanks for having me. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today here in Cleveland, and you've even got some sun, so that's terrific. Love it. Cheryl Hoffman, Cleveland Museum of Natural History and co-vice chair of Community Partnership for Arts and Culture. I think it was probably six or seven years ago, CPAC introduced the Artist as Entrepreneur series, which has been wildly successful for our artists here in Cleveland. And in the last few years, we've been able to expand that program by working with COSI, the Council on Small Enterprises here in Cleveland. And I'm, I'm wondering, how do you see educating other chambers of commerce and merchants organizations in the importance of um, training and educating artists? And, and what role will the NEH have in educating chambers of commerce? I wish we could bring them here. I mean, I mean that would be that would be the or or, or if you could send emissaries there, uh, you know some. All I can say is that some communities get it and and uh, and and some don't. I mean, Cleveland is way ahead of the curve. I mean, that's that that is that is obvious, and you're to be commended on that. Uh, it's not so obvious um, everywhere. A lot of this has to do with um, the tradition uh, of arts in a, in a in a place. If it's if it's brand new or if there's a long history of it. Cleveland has a long history. Uh, that, it, it, you know, that makes it really part of the DNA in, 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 in people who, who live here. Uh, it's, not true, uh, it's not true everywhere. There's some cities in Florida I could mention, but I, 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 I won't. Uh, Mr. Landers, Bob Grace. Where are we? Oh, oh there, right here. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think the programs you talked about in your speech are very exciting. But my biggest concern with the future of the arts is how do we attract the younger generation? We've talked about this for a decade at least, but I don't see uh, many great results coming from it. And the younger generation have different communications, different attention spans. Uh, they're brought up totally different than the people you see in the audiences today. And if we don't find a way to attract them to the arts, I'm wondering who's going to be in the audiences in another decade or two. Can you shed any light on anything you're doing in that respect or any very successful programs around the country you've seen? Well, you just press one of my buttons, which is uh, arts education. I mean, the, the, the biggest indicator of arts participation is exposure to it when, when you're very young, uh, you know, K, K through 12 arts education. It is, everywhere I go, I see it's the first thing being cut from school curriculum, uh, curricula as, as, there, as there are budget issues. Of course, it should be, it should be the last. And, um, you know, the arts are um, a way that, 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 you know, a kid who has a, you know, different sensibility than one who can perform on standardized tests can find a role for himself or herself uh, in the world. That has to start with being exposed to music and art and drama at a very young age in the, in the schools. And it's not something that can be done with a wave of the wand. Uh, Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, is, is uh, very big in the arts. He gets this. But there's, you know, the Department of Education itself plays a very limited role nationwide. These, these, these programs are funded by the states and, and, and local school districts, as, as you know. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. There, there has to be school district by school district battle for, for uh, arts education in, in, in the schools. And so, so it has to start there, number one. Secondly, um, to some extent, we have to be agnostic about how art is accessed uh, by, by new generations. It's not necessarily the way we accessed it. 
and we have to be amenable to, you know, to the digital media and to, to, to the, way, uh, the way art is accessed uh, now more, more and more. And um, I think artistic institutions everywhere are now grappling with this and, and, um, and wrestling with how they can deliver what they have um, through ways other than being the big temple on the hill that people approach with some trepidation and pro probably intimidation. Uh, but to get out in the communities, to get there through digital media, to get there physically um, in, in, in the communities themselves. And I think that's, um, that's something that we're starting to talk about uh, everywhere. But it's a, big, uh, it's a big challenge and a big issue. Otherwise, yes, we're not going to have uh, arts organizations because we won't have audiences. I, um, I agree completely. Yes. Uh, Mr. Landsman, I've been fascinated by your wonderful, wonderful speech, and it's exciting, and I'm a great lover of Cleveland. I read in the paper this morning that they're planning to try to put forth uh, an increase in the taxes on the wealthy, which I think is an excellent idea, but I'm very concerned about how this is going to affect the people who donate to our arts organizations. Or are these the people who weren't donating to begin with, and maybe this money will come in and the NEA will be able to benefit us even more? I don't know uh, that. Uh, that, too, may be above my grade, uh, pay grade, or maybe in that, it, may be, it may be in the 11-foot um, pole category for things I shouldn't even touch, think about touching with a 10-foot pole. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to imagine that if you cut out, if you eliminated the deductibility for charitable giving, uh, it's hard to imagine that that wouldn't have an impact on, um, on arts organizations uh, everywhere, not to mention universities and, and numerous recipients of that, but that's, um, that's for others to wrestle with, um, not me, uh, but certainly it's going to be an issue coming up. Uh, Dr. Landsman, uh, you spoke about the need for uh, these arts institutions to pull down their silos. What are you doing to promote greater collaboration among artistic organizations, especially among the older ones that are so used to operating entirely on their own? Well, in, in, the, um, in the Art Town grants and the Art Place grants, we give those grants to consortiums. We give them to, to uh, partnerships. And the, partner, and the partnership aspect of it is required by us. So that's an important element of it. Uh, again, some communities do better about collaboration than, 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 than others. I was in Columbus yesterday where it seems to be very good. Um, but, um, you know, I think it varies from place to place. But I, I think the... the not only the, the cultural institutions themselves, but their patrons and customers uh, have to all get together and realize that they form a constituency, a single constituency that needs to speak with a, con with a, with a, with a single voice to the elected representatives, to the political structure, uh, and so forth. That's, that's very important. It really is. Megan Van Voris, Vice President, Community Partnership for Arts and Culture. At the federal level, we have an extremely polarized congressional environment. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious how Congress has perceived your artwork's messages, um, and in particular, in the face of increasing, increasing pressure on governmental spending, what you think the potential is of arts funding through some of the other agencies you've discussed, like the Department of Education, like the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and so forth, because that, that does seem to be your strategy. I'm curious how that's being, how that's being perceived. Well, I think politically our support is becoming um, more and more bipartisan. In the, in the, in the last uh, budget rounds, there, there was, as always comes up, a, an amendment to uh, further defund uh, the NEA. Uh, in the first, uh, first time this, uh, I guess back in January or so, when this came up uh, through Congress, uh, the amendment passed with uh, 20, 20 uh, I believe the number was 20, uh, nay votes from the Republicans. This time, uh, it was defeated with 55 Republican nays. Uh, which is, a, I think, a, a, a sea change. Um, Congressman uh, T. Berry and Congressman Latourette uh, have been uh, great supporters of, uh, of the NEA. I think there is bipartisan support for, uh, for our activities. And I think uh, uh, across Congress, as, as, we, as we take this particular message that we're part, of, um, we're, we're, we're part of the solution for coming out of this recession, I think that narrative has a lot more traction in Congress than, than others that we've had. Um, as far as the other federal agencies are, are, are concerned, um, we are, I think, making real progress there. One of my, uh, one of my proudest days was uh, a few months ago when uh, a press release was issued 
jointly by the NEA and HUD. And just to see a piece of stationery uh, with our logos at the top, and it said, you know, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rocco Landisman, and Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, today jointly announced it was a $100 million NOFA for which, to which arts organizations were encouraged to apply. They did apply. We sat with the, um, uh, with, with the folks at HUD together and, and made decisions about, about which arts organizations were, would receive those fundings. It was a, it was a joint thing between, between the two of us. That opens up significant new funding streams for the arts that were never there before. And if part of my job is to get significant new resources in the field, a $100 million HUD NOFA is a, is a, is a, is a real start. Hi, Dennis Hi. Griesmer, Cleveland Public Theater. How are you doing? Great. I'm just really curious, in your role as the chairperson, if you have a lot of opportunity to speak to individual senators or individual congressmen about their experience of the arts. And if you have some anecdotes about their experience of the arts, how they feel about the arts, and what sort of conclusions you might draw about the political animal and its relationship to the arts. Well, some states and some senators again, have much long, a much longer uh, tradition for this. Rhode, Rhode Island Senator Claiborne Pell was really one of the uh, founders of the, uh, of the NEA. And his uh, successors, Senator Whitehouse and Senator Reed, are passionate uh, supporters of the, uh, uh, of the arts. They're, they're, uh, they're great about it. Um, and I spent a whole day with, uh, with Senator Whitehouse uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in Providence not, not long ago. Um, but wherever, wherever I go, uh, uh, Sen Senator McCaskill from my home state of Missouri is an um, ex officio member of our council. Uh, wherever I can connect to the senators and the congressmen to spend time in their district, uh, I do. And uh, my experience is, is that when you engage them personally and when they see in their own states and their own districts what the arts can do, uh, they, they, become, uh, they become allies. But that's you know, a constant part of the, uh, part, part of the job, no, no question. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Sure. Um, my name is Vicki Boatwright. I'm an artist um, who is one of those people you said thinks she's special. Um, <laughs> you are. <laughs> and I appreciate you saying that I am. Um, I'm also not from Cleveland. I'm from a city 60 miles south of here. I'm from Canton, Ohio, which is the Football Hall of Fame. Okay. I'm a football fan, too. Yeah, okay. and, and we actually have no football team in Canton, and yet it is the football city of America. Um, we have a burgeoning arts district that um, arts entrepreneurs and, and our city council, or uh, not city council, the um, Chamber of Commerce, have significantly bought into this concept of economic development. One of the problems I think that we're experiencing, however, is that this is not a culture that or the overall culture is not as educated about the arts. So there's a lot of pressures, um, I hate to sound elitist, but I'm going to, um, to kind of dumb it down. Um, that not all arts, or not all entertainment is art, and not all art is entertaining, um, but somewhere there's gotta be a happy medium um, I'm just wondering how you deal with the pressures from people who are not educated about the arts that, you know, that there's something between um, the opera and Justin Bieber um, and that we don't end up with a tractor pole going down our arts district. How do, how do you deal with those kind of tensions? Well, it's hard because, I mean, you want to relate, you, you, want, you want to have an audience, you want to relate to, to, your, to your community. Uh, but it shouldn't always be, you know, lowest common denominator. So it's, I think in every community, you find a different uh, point of intersection. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's always, a, uh, always a challenge. One of the, one of the uh, reasons that there's an NEA, and one of the reasons that there is um, arts patronage and subsidy in general, is so that the marketplace isn't the only determinant of what is um, uh, pervaded, of, what is, of, of what, is, what is out there. Uh, there has to be a place for the art that is difficult, that's challenging, uh, that is not uh, easy li listening. Um, you know, they're, they're doing Galileo uh, down, down, down the street. That's not uh, box office Bafo usually, you know, plays by, plays by Brecht. Um, and, um, you know, I think if you have a subsidy, if you have the protection uh, to be able to do more venturesome or more interesting work, uh, it's incumbent upon you to, uh, uh, to do it. 
I, 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 you know, feel for where you're at. You're at. I really do. And it's one of the reasons we have subsidy in the first place. Hi, yeah. I'm uh, James Kraus from Ingenuity Fest. Um, we've talked a lot about how uh, the arts can redefine themselves to an audience in the digital age. In this age of technological innovation and uh, digital communication, what about how uh, uh, creative, innovative people define themselves as artists? Um, is that something that uh, you see as important? Uh, people who don't normally define themselves as artists um, kind of coming into the fray? Yes, I, I, I think the definition of art and artist is, uh, is, is, very, is very broad. Um, I think if you're innovative, if you're creative, if you're imaginative, you have an element of, uh, of art. When, when, we, when we speak of artfulness, I think we think of that element that takes it away from the predictable, the quotidian, the uh, expected, and has some element of imagination or creativity. You know, uh, in, in whatever field, you know, the, the expression, uh, the art of the deal, um, the art of cooking, the art of sex. Uh, it, it, what it refers to is something that brings it up a little bit out of the, uh, out of the ordinary and the, and, and the predictable and expected, uh, that there's some imaginative leap that's made that lifts it up. And, I, and I, in, that, in that sense, I, I think of the word uh, uh, art and artist uh, very broadly, exactly what you're saying. Hi, you've talked about the uh, uh, promoting of the arts as an economic engine. What is the budget of the NEA, and do you know how many jobs nationally are related specifically or directly to the arts? And then also, how do you determine how to make grants? Are there committees, or what's the evaluation process? Okay, three different questions, if I can remember them all, uh, and good ones. Oh, the budget of the NEA, first of all, is about $155 million in I think, in the last uh, uh, the, the last, the last go around. Um, we make the grants uh, through uh, peer panel um, uh, recommendation. What, if, if you're doing a, um, a th if you're doing theater grants, you bring theater experts, uh, administrators of theater, theater artists, uh, people who know the, you know, know that world together, and they collectively decide on the grants. It's completely independent. The NEA staff, me, none of us have input on that. It's done by. Uh, by a peer panel. Um, and um, in terms of employment, there are about, in these are rough terms, about two million artists in this country and about five and a half million arts-related jobs. So five and a half million jobs related to the arts is a, is a, is a significant constituency in, uh, anywhere. I think I got all three. Okay. Hi, That's, thanks. Yeah. Uh, over here, um, you talked a little bit about oh, range and yeah. diversity. Uh, not, but I'd like to ask you about a different sort of diversity, not just the uh, the, the uh, different arts disciplines, but for instance, the large to the small, the large mega, uh, mega musical that might roll in to the neighborhood uh, theater or a chalk fest or a festival or even public sculpture. And I wonder if you can comment about the range of of then that, that sort of diversity in terms of value for a community. I think it's all, it's all important, uh, just like in, in, um, in baseball, you have major league teams, minor league teams, sandlot baseball, little leagues, and you know, kids uh, playing stickball in, 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 down the street. You need to have the whole, the whole spectrum in the, uh, in the arts. We've been increasingly uh, focused uh, on, the, um, on some of the public arts um, that intersect more with, uh, with, with, the, with, with the community. D design, for instance, um, architecture, uh, parks, uh, aesthetic elements uh, in, in, in walkways and, and so forth, those affect people who will never go into an arts institution, ever. And yet they're affected when they're walking down the street and seeing how beautiful their, their city is and how well it's, uh, well it's designed. But the whole, the whole spectrum is important. Uh, and I don't mean to, you know, denigrate the, the importance of the, uh, of the temples, of high culture either. Those, those are very important. Uh, but we need, we need the, whole, uh, the whole ecosystem. The whole, the whole thing is important and, and has, to be, has to be supported everywhere. Yeah. As a member of the arts and culture community, and for fear of getting a lot of dirty looks from members of the arts and culture community in this room, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, we've been hearing in this region in particular about arts as an economic engine for years and have re responded to that by building a large arts and culture, 
economy in this region. Can you talk about the potential for saturation of the market and how much a, a community can, how much arts and culture a community can hold before it, it becomes a detriment, if it does? Well, I'm, I'm always in favor of, of, of more arts. Um, you know, more arts programming, more, uh, more everything, to the extent it can be supported. I worry sometimes um, that we have too, sometimes too many institutions or organizations for the, um, for the amount of support that, that there is. And I, I talked about this at Arena Stage and was met with howls of anger and, and uh, animosity. And my feeling was, well, we should at least have the discussion. This is, this is a reality. We, we do a lot of research at the NEA, and we found that um, in the performing arts, certainly, but also museums, uh, participation has been um, declining, uh, notably over, over, over the last uh, dozen, 15 years or so. And while at the same time, the number of arts organizations has been proliferating exponentially. Well, at some point, there's a disconnect. You can't keep having less attendance and more and more theaters, for instance. So we at least have to have discussion about whether there, from, from the funder's perspective, about whether there should be a somewhat selective approach toward, toward funding. And, and, and as, I, you know, as, as I've often said, this is not to fund the most successful. This is not survival of the fittest. or to, to fund only the biggest or the most successful. It's to fund the most interesting, the most compelling, the, mo the, the, the most uh, venturesome. Uh, but, but maybe not everyone. And uh, at some point, you have to right-size the, the, the cultural landscape uh, in terms of supply and demand. And, and I, I know people hate it when I say that, uh, but it seems to me a discussion that, that, uh, that, we, that we, have to, uh, we have to engage. Uh, Greg Peckham, Cleveland Public Art. Uh, thanks for being here. One of the programs, and you started to allude to it, uh, that the NEA has funded for over 20 years is the Mayor's Institute on Civic Design. Um, and uh, in our history in Cleveland, not any of our mayors uh, in the time that program has existed has participated. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what uh, the reason that you've been funding that program for so many years, um, what some of the successes um, for elected officials have been that have come out of that, and what, uh, how we can advocate for our elected officials to participate. Well, we've got to get the mayor of Cleveland there, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, and I'm going to extend him a personal invitation. I'm going to call him. I, I was just talking to him you know, bef before this event. Um, this is one of our, great, our, best, our greatest programs, uh, as, as I think you know. What, I was just at one in Charleston uh, the other day. And what happens is they bring together, I don't know, five or six mayors, along with experts in um, urban planning and design and architecture. And each mayor presents a, an issue for his city. Um, you know, he may, he may have a blighted waterfront and, and wants to figure out what to do about that, how to, how to handle it. And designers, architects, artists sit down with him and have a dialogue back and forth with, with that mayor, with, with him or her, to, to talk about, uh, to, uh, to, to engage ideas about how that might be addressed. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of mayors go through this program. It's been tremendously uh, successful. And the mayors usually come back with great ideas for uh, what to do in their, um, in, in their cities. It's a, it's a uh, tremendous program. In fact, uh, when we started doing the um, Our Town funding, before it was called Our Town, before we had an appropriation from Congress for that, uh, we called it, uh, we did the same thing. We called it MICD 25, the 25th anniversary of the Mayor's Institute in City Design, um, was, was what, it, what, 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 what that was called, and it's a tremendously important uh, program, and I encourage everybody to, to, to embrace it. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to Rocco Landisman, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you, Dr. Landisman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. <laughs>